Now, the Humane Society says last year it received over 2,000 welfare calls, and last month alone there was a 24% increase in calls. I'm joined now by Caitlin Mitchell. She is an animal rights lawyer and advocate. Caitlin, the president of the Humane Society here, calling for changes to the way animals are seen through the criminal code so they aren't seen as property. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's it's a really important issue, and it's one that you know we we've heard these calls for years from animal protection groups and even some members of parliament. Um, I think most members of Canadian society don't think of animals as being mere property, and so it is time I think that our criminal code was amended to reflect the fact that animals really are members of our community. Would this be more of a symbolic impact? Would it really change how animal cruelty cases are tried? I think it depends. You know, I would say in cases like this where we're where we're thinking about, you know, a really egregious act of cruelty to one specific animal, I'm not sure that it would um, make a huge difference. You know, in, in this case, for instance, we've seen um, that you know charges have been laid um, with regard to this the specific incidents of the kitten um, that happened recently in Winnipeg. But you know, I do think that it would send a really important signal to courts and to enforcement officials that you know violent crimes against animals are crimes of violence and they're not mm -hmm. mere property crimes. So I think it could be a really important signal in that respect. Now we've seen a dramatic increase in animal abuse calls in Manitoba. Any insight into why? No, it's very interesting for me to hear those uh, statistics. Um, you know, what I would say is that I think that there is a really increasing recognition on the part of, you know, Canadians and uh, government officials, uh, really, you know, everyone recognizing that, um, you know, animals are members of our community, they're deserving of concern. So, you know, it's not a surprise to me that people would be increasingly um, concerned about animals and reporting their concerns to authorities. Now, in cases like this with the kitten, people want to see justice, a lot of people want to see punishment, but what steps can be taken to prevent incidents like this from happening again? Does the answer lie in maybe more screening? Well, I think it's a really important question because I get it, you know, that you hear about a, a case like this and, and people are outraged, you know, and they want to know that justice has been done. But I, I think that in cases like this, you know, the focus doesn't need to just be on punishment and incarceration. What I really hope we see is is important tools like, you know, for instance, prohibition orders that can prohibit individuals from owning or having access to animals, and even, you know, orders that go to try to, to rehabilitate the offender themselves, whether they need counseling, substance abuse treatment, um, you know, or animal sensitivity mm -hmm. training. There's a range of tools that are available to prevent cruelty from happening again in the future. And while we have you here, Caitlin, today, of course, we're focusing on pets or companion animals. Where do other animals like livestock fit into protection? They're really left out. Uh, the, the shortest answer possible. Canada's animal protection laws are some of the worst in the Western world. Um, we have laws that protect individual animals from, you know, acts like this of really egregious cruelty, but our laws do not protect animals from uh, harm mm -hmm. and suffering caused by uh, any range of industrial uses, whether that's, you know, in the agricultural setting or, you know, in laboratories. Um, I think that our laws really need to catch up and, and protect all animals from suffering. Appreciate your insight. Caitlin Mitchell, thank you. Thank you.